And the fact that I sort of blew them off and then went away <laughs> made them even more desperate to track me down. So they somehow tracked me down, and I knew they were serious when they said uh, they wanted to fly me out to LA to meet me. <coughs> so that's how I got work on a movie called Baby's Day Out, which was written and produced by John Hughes. Which and I, I loved. Yeah, it's a fun movie. Yeah, I just was upset that the baby didn't get hit by a car. Yeah, <laughs> I know. We still get worries about that. Um, so the movie is uh, centered around this little baby. He's the son of a rich family. He gets kidnapped and taken to the city by these three mooks. And um, they bring along his favorite book, which is called Baby's Day Out. Baby loves this book. There's scenes of him, you know, reading it with his nanny, which is uh, Cynthia Nixon. And um, so they, they take the book with them. And the baby, who is nine months old, uh, can't speak. So we see the book throughout the movie. And again, this goes back to what you were saying about props being a big part of the story. Props are often very important for exposition and things in movies, even when you just see them in passing. They can be used to sort of establish something about a character, and they're often used to kind of drive the plot forward. And this is a good example of that. It's a major part of the exposition of the of the film. And doesn't the sometimes the actors require part props to help them with yeah. their character? Yeah. I worked on movies where even long before they started shooting, the actors were requesting period props, the Alamo was like that. The actors, you know, I, I guess if they're method actors, I don't really know, but they wanted to wear the costumes, they wanted to have, <coughs> read the books that the character would have read, they wanted to have papers in their pocket that these guys would have had. Um, so, you know, that can be a really important thing too. I mean, you gotta figure if you're an actor, I just watched a, a screener for a movie that's still in production, um, and it's Shazam 2, which I worked on and I'm continuing to work on. And it was, uh, all the special effects were still in the very early stages. And so you see these actors, like, you know, standing on a, basically a blue, in front of a blue screen going, rah, you know, screaming at some demon flying by, and I'm like, that, how hard must that be? And I always think that it must be a lot easier for them if the prop, you know, looks more real. Which is why when I do a prop book, I include, uh, like I, I never, they often say, oh, we just need a few pages in the middle and the rest can be blank. I always put other pages in, because I figure, you know, I've actually been on set where the actor has gone, oh, it's all blank after here. Like, what if I wanted to flip through it? So, you know, I think it, it's worthwhile doing. But, so, here I am, I'm in Chicago for six months, working on a movie set. I'd done, previously done a little bit of work for television, but it was really low budget stuff. And these are stills from the movie, so just to show you how big a part the book plays in the movie. Um, and again, because the baby can't talk, how we, the baby escapes from the kidnappers, gets loose in the city, and does sort of acts out things that he remembers from the book and how we know what the baby is thinking is we'll see the baby crawling along the street and then he'll see a cab, for instance, and then they'll go back to, so we'll see the baby crawling, we'll see a close up of the baby going, ah, then we see a shot of the cab, then we see another shot of the baby's face and kind of like realizing like, oh, cab from the book then they'll show a shot of the cab again and cross dissolve to the illustration in the book, cross dissolve back to the cab, there, thereby letting us, the audience, know that the baby recognizes this from his book and he crawls into the cab and goes on. So the book was all done based on the script? It was done based on the script and also I had to work really, this is why I was in Chicago, I had to work really closely with the transportation department because you know, the bus had to look like the bus that they could get, which actually changed several times. Um, I had to work, I had to go on location scouts so that I could see, okay, when they go to the zoo, it doesn't have to be exactly like, I mean, we wanted it to resemble enough that it 
you could sell this idea that the baby is getting, you know, his cues from the book and recognizing things in the real world from the book. But um, it had to be close enough and not exactly the same. So, and, and again, you know, you're going on a location scout and I'm like, okay, this place is great. This is going to be for the zoo scene. We're going to do all this stuff here. We're going to build a set for the cages. Um, and I just got a really, like a full immersion uh, in, in you know, how movies are put together. And you see some of that here. Well, so there's my sketches that I'm doing that, that are, again, this is all based on the script. So there's a, a scene where the baby goes into Marshall Field on his own, uh, which is a big park store in Chicago, or was. Um, and so, you know, we had to have a scene in the book. And the pages all had to, the, this is a thing that happens quite a lot on these gigs, is the uh, pages of a book, for instance, or the lines that an actor reads from a letter, only a small part of it is scripted, and you have to fill out all the rest. Because obviously when an actor is holding a letter, reading two lines from it, the letter has to be, you know, filling up the page. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's upon me to, figure out what the rest of that copy is. And it was the same thing with this book. We had to, I had to think of pages that kind of connected these two sort of disparate scenes. Um, there's the baby. So again, this is what I'm trying to show you here is what it was like for me being introduced to this incredibly new world. So you see that hand in the upper right, that's somebody called Baby Wrangler. <laughs> and the baby rambler's job is to basically bond. They almost always have two babies when there's mm. babies involved in the shoot, twins. And um, he had this little device, which you can't see, but he's holding it in his hand. And it has little lights and sounds and stuff. And it's, it's like he kind of learns with the baby, uh, you know, okay, this will make him smile. He thinks this is funny. And of course, because it's twins, the other twin would stare at him like, what the hell are you doing? You know? um, so it's really involved, difficult job. This is like the animal trainers. He, yes. Yeah, meeting their figures. Right. You know, like we have to get this pigeon to somehow peck out someone's eyeball. <laughs> um, so again, you know, I, I, because they hadn't really worked with an illustrator before, they didn't know where to put me. So they actually, I shared a gigantic trailer with the producer. So I'm in, right in the middle of stuff. He's having all these meetings with the actors and stuff. And again, some of the actors appear in the book, so I'm having to meet the actors. Um, and the, for the kidnappers, they went through about five actors before they finally settled on the, on the guys who got the job. But you can see, they, I was in a trailer in a parking lot. And there were about <coughs> six trailers. The entire art department was crowded into one trailer. <laughs> and I had half a trailer to myself. Um, and this is the set, this is the roof of the kidnapper's apartment, and this is built inside of a huge warehouse along with a lot of other sets. You can see in the background some of the other sets. Um, and you can also see uh, up on the far left there, uh, the painted backdrops for the rest of the city. Um, so because of the, so this is all designed by guys called set designers, and they. Basically, set designers work with concept artists and the director to um, get the whole look of how all the buildings and interiors look, and, um, and the production designer. Production designer is in charge of the look of everything in the movie except the actors. So everybody in the art department works under and answers to the production designer and answers to the director. Um, so uh, the guy, all the guys working in the set design were from California. They all lived in these bungalows, and they were having to design these rooftop urban scenes. And so they were coming to me saying, you know, does this look right for a, a rooftop of a kind of a skeevy apartment building in Chicago? And I said, it, the one thing that you left off is chimneys. There'd be tons of chimneys and pipes and things sticking up up there. Um, so, you know, this is basically I, my commute every day. I'd get to my trailer and then I would walk through all this stuff to get to the art department trailer on the other side is of the Is that normal for you to be in, uh, on set? No, 
it's not normal at all. I, I haven't been on set in years. Um, it was because the, the old, it, it's loosening up now, but for a long time, if you weren't there, they got nervous. They wanted you to be there, or at the very least, they wanted to meet you. Um, I don't know why, it just, and when I was uh, working on this movie, uh, the special effects people had gigantic mats, and all, all of the people were in awe, like, oh my god, you know, they were doing some really early crude visual effects, but all they were using it for was combining um, photographs together, cutting and pasting buildings to create these sort of idealized uh, landscapes or cityscapes. And then they would send these to LA where they would have them painted as these gigantic backdrops. They, they reckoned that they were the largest painted backdrops ever done for a movie. And you gotta think, you know, in the North by the Northwest, when he's on Mount Rushmore, and they're scrambling down, you know, and you see this, that's a paint backdrop. So these things were huge. And you can see that there. This is another set. That is a, uh, what is it, five-story um, skyscraper under construction, which a lot of the, you know, scenes involve falling off of. And you can see one of the painted backdrops hanging, you see the back of it there. And you can just get a sense of how big it is. There's an even bigger one wrapped around the back of it. Um, they were, I, I, I don't know how tall, five or six stories tall. So were there other there's no props that you had to make for Baby Stay Out? No, that was the only thing. I mean, I consulted on a couple of things, but um, basically, you know, I got this six month, like I said, full immersion into how these things are done and how hard these people work too, that was the other thing. I thought, oh, we're gonna go to Chicago, and you know, first night there, let's all go out with the art bar and have dinner, and you know. And they work, they start off with a 12 hour day. So they work from either six or seven in the morning until six or seven at night. So you said that you didn't think you'd ever do this again. After That's that. right, after I was finished this, I thought, you know, that was fun. There's there's my pictures of Jonah Penny for the, for the book. And uh, there's the illustration of for the book. Yeah, so I get back to New York, and I'm like, well, that was, you know, part of, when do they ever need a book in a movie again? I'm, I'll never do that again. And in fact, I didn't. For 10 years, I didn't do uh, any other movie work. I would occasionally get phone calls, but, um, you know, just about your little, you know, what, what do you think this would look like kind of a thing, phone call. And then, uh, in, uh, Oh God, I forget what year it was. Oh, so it would have been 2000 years back. Yeah, so 2003, I get a call from a guy saying, hey, I'm the prop master on a movie we're shooting called The Alamo. Um, and I was in this, so they didn't, you know, this is how kind of little thought would, would be put into these kind of props back in, you know, in these days, 2000s and before, um, early 2000s. Uh, so it says in the script that this character in the Alamo, a, a real, based, you know, a real guy, William Travis, had a journal. And so the prop master goes through the script and marks all the things that he has to get together. And he's like, oh, okay, journal. I got to get a journal. He goes in. The only resource he has is the set, the, uh, the set designer, art department, which basically these guys are draftsmen who draw, you know, drawings for the construction crew to build the sets. Mm -hmm. But that's the closest thing that they would have to somebody who might know something about a book. So he goes into the set designer's art department and says, hey, anybody here know anybody who can give me some advice on what William Travis's 1835 journal would have looked like? And one of the set designers was a guy I worked with on Baby's Day Out. And he said, oh, you know, call this guy. He, you know, he collects old ephemeral and junk and stuff. He might know. And so the guy calls me up and he explains what it is and he said, you know what it would have looked like? And, you know, I'd been collecting all this stuff and thinking to myself, I had all my binds. Like, you know, this old, this old, uh, what's your cosmic purpose? Yeah. So the guy calls me up and he says, would you know what this would look like? And I mean, it was just like, I mean, it was like cosmic. 
because I said, yeah, in fact, I have a ledger from 1835, <laughs> but it's a store ledger, it's a counter ledger, and it's big, it's tall, it's about six, seven inches wide by, I don't know, 16, 18 inches tall, inch and a half, two inches thick, weighs a ton. William Travis, on horseback, with a saddlebag, everything he owns in a saddlebag, I doubt he would have hauled one of these with him. Um, but I happened to have, among the other the crappy ephemera I collected, a list of things that were for sale in an early 19th century stationery store. <laughs> and one of the things listed was a pocket ledger. And they were listed with trade binding, you know, something binding leather, full leather binding. So I related to this to him and I said, a trade binding from that period, um, I have basically the books that were that standardized American spelling, spelling uh, were these, um, what are called spellers, these school books for kids. And they, they were by Webster, um, who did the dictionary. And I have one from 1801, I think, and then some of them into the 1830s. And they all had a trade binding. So I described them to them. I said, you know, they're small because they're pocket ledgers. And they have pale blue cloth on the outside. They have a brown leather spine. Inside they have um, machine-made paper because machine-made paper was started in, in France in the late uh, 1700s. And it, it spread very rapidly because you can make a lot of paper with a machine. And they, are, they have ruled lines because there's something called the Hickok ruling machine that was invented in the late uh, 1700s that actually draws lines on paper using a series of pen nibs that are fed through tubes. And the Hickok ruling machine is still used, or versions of it are still used to make lined paper because it's just a really easy, efficient way to make lined paper. And his prop man, his prop master had a heart attack. Yeah. Well, but no, he's, so he's, I, you know, give him this big spiel and he's like, nah. And we're thinking like, Got like a hunk of deer hide around it with a thong that he wraps around a hunk of antler or something, you know. And I'm like, okay, whatever, I'll, I'll build you whatever you want. And so then he had, they sent a production assistant to uh, the mu museum in Alamo, I guess, and they pulled out William Travis's diary and it looked exactly like I described, like <laughs> sheer fluke. But I mean, basically, you know, I could have told the guy anything after. <laughs> like, yeah, William Travis used a, a ray gun. I said, where'd he die? Um, so I, I ended up working on the Alamo for 17 months because just because the, the guy had been so impressed at this totally lucky guess that I had made about William Travis, Travis's journal. Um, and they also switched directors in the middle, and everything that I made had been stolen out of the prop trailer when they, they shut down production. So the new prop master came back and said, where's all this stuff? You know, you were supposed to ship this stuff, and it's not in the trailer. And I said, I have all the FedEx shipping labels. It's I shipped it all. It's all there. No prop trailer. So you there. presume that it was for souvenirs or resale? Resale. They. It was kind of a big scandal at the time. Uh, I believe they tracked. They lost thirty thousand dollars worth of guns alone, which you know, back in two thousand three, um, whatever that translates into with inflation, probably a million. But. Uh, um, yeah, they lost tons of stuff, and they, I think, found the people. Because uh, basically the crew was told, like, leave. You have two days to get out of here and leave. We're shutting down production. They locked everything up, left, and it was uh, at least a month and a half before they got a new director in. And during that time, somebody knew all this stuff was sitting in this tractor trailer in the, in the lot. So they stole it all. So I ended up getting calls for doing all kinds of stuff. And this was, so on Baby's Day Out, I had done just this one kid's book. It was working in a style that I was very familiar with and had, you know, a lot of examples of. Chicago is where the Dick and Jane books were, were published, and uh, where, where Scott Forsman was based, and all the and artists. Still is. Yes, that's right. And all the illustrators are based in Chicago. And you could go into, like, junk stores and stuff and find, like, old Dick and Jane books from the 30s and stuff for pennies. Because it just was like where they were from, I guess. It was just easy. And I uh, 
was able to talk to people who had worked there and the illustrators and stuff. So it was, you know, more for fun. It wasn't really for research. I didn't really need to research anything on the book. Then I'm working on the Alamo, and it's the total opposite. I have to do tons and tons of in-depth research. This is Davy Crockett's almanac. Davy Crockett was actually an author and published an almanac, and he was hilarious. He was really, really funny. Um, he published these stories uh, about his exploits, but they were sort of mocking himself. I mean, one story, he's out hunting in the woods and, you know, hunting raccoons or something, and to make a hat, I guess. Um, and he uh, gets tired, and he lays down to take a nap, and he puts his head in the crook of a tree, you know, the tree trunk comes up and the branches go up this way and he puts his head in there to rest. And he wakes up and the, his head is stuck in the crook of the tree and there are Indians creeping up on him and he's stuck. <laughs> and it just, it's hilarious. Um, but there was nowhere to find this. Uh, I had to like call museums and get them, one museum would have a couple of pages from one. And it was hours and hours and days of work to construct this exact copy of Davy Crockett's Almanac which we basically see um, a, a young soldier bringing it up to Davy Crockett to get his autograph, and it's rolled up in his hand. You can't even see it, and Davy Crockett just sort of hands it back. It's a couple of seconds. Get that, and never, they never show him inside, nothing. And that's, you know, that's the story of my life with a lot of these props. But that was my first experience with this kind of really in-depth um, research and I mean, I had done research out of my own interest in things like, you know, I had that list from the stationery shop. And, uh, I used to research typefaces because I was reestablishing my letterpress operation and I was buying a lot of old type. And when I had worked as a printer uh, back in my teens in the 70s, I could give a rat's ass about type. I didn't care anything about design. I cared about printing and printing presses. I was didn't care about design, but when I started buying presses and type again, I suddenly, you know, had this newfound interest in it, and I was particularly interested in the 19th century and this whole history of display type art, which was basically a 19th century printing, and all the boundaries, and then the competition to create the most outlandish faces, and then the wood type, and all these different things. And I got fascinated with that, but it was just purely for my own interest. Um, but it ended up being really important on this, the, the Alamo thing. And I suddenly started realizing all this crap that I've been collecting or personally interested in, you know, if there actually is a, a real use for it. Um, so there's some of the letters. This again, heavily researched, like what did the letter look like in 1835? How did people mail it? You know, Ben Franklin founded the post office, but they didn't have stamps back then. They didn't have envelopes. Back didn't have envelopes. Letters were charged by the number of pieces of paper. Um, and so people folded letters in a certain way. They folded two inch long strips down the sides, folded them over, and then folded it in thirds and sealed it with a piece of wax. And the strips were so that you couldn't make a tube out of the letter and read what was inside, the, the side strips and um, you know, and, and they were super into uh, the you know everything being exactly right on this movie. Luckily, because that was rare back then. People would go, ah, nobody cares. Nobody's gonna notice. You know, all the, the director was like, yeah, you know, no one cares. But so then I had to learn how to um, write like William Travis or some of the other historic characters. In you see the whole method acting thing. You can see how dirty the screen is, huh? Um, and you know he's probably sleeping in those clothes too. Uh, then apparently William Travis was a uh, very vain. He designed his own military uniform, so they wanted to have that in there. They ended up shooting and editing together a six-hour movie, uh, which they the studio then said, "No, nope, gotta get that down to two hours." <laughs> So every, all this, I mean, you see, I'm showing you shots from the movie, so obviously some of the work made it in, but um, so much of the stuff that I killed myself over is just either not in it or you know, not, not very visible. 
Well, speaking of stuff you killed yourself over. Yes. <laughs> so this is, uh, so that kind of started my, really is, is where my career as a, a prop maker, designer started uh, on the Alamo. I learned a lot on both of those films, but the Alamo was really where I learned about, you know, getting things right and getting the research right and that there were in fact people who cared about how things look. Um, and so this is a movie that I worked on in 2007. Uh, and this movie they were writing while they were uh, shooting it. So it's, which it's frequently happens, there's rewrites and sometimes they go back for reshoots, the script changes and stuff. But this one was really on the fly. They basically sold it to Disney with a two page uh, written outline in November, and Disney said, great, we start shooting in January. And so I got a transfer call to design the Book of Secrets. And they originally wanted something really, you know, there's always that thing in the movie, like, oh, we want this thing to be really, like it's gotta be really big and have hardware on it, and be, you know, chains and locks, and, you know, weighing 500 pounds and stuff like that. And we went through a couple of design iterations that were like that. Here's the book. Yeah, there's, I described this. Um, and at one point, somebody on the crew, a concept artist on the crew, sort of took the work that I had done. And there's a picture of this thing that he or she designed uh, in the book, which is like your classic, over the top, you know, movie, big, scary, important book, like the design of the book has to say, this book is really important, you know. I mean, I'm surprised they didn't put a rolling eyeball on the cover for good measure, but uh, because, again, because they were writing it on the fly, um, and this is another thing uh, I mentioned in the book, they, uh, in the early iterations, they had um, Secret Service agent carried. So this book is the President's Book of Secrets, <coughs> which is what we always call it. Um, and the presidents would write down all these things that were too terrible to ever be revealed, but the next president had to learn, you know, these, these horrible or, you know, terrifying or bizarre secrets. So it was an exquisite corpse for the president. Yeah, exactly. Like each guy would come in and go, oh my God, <laughs> really? the last guy did that. You know, of course, everything got, you know, the, the whole idea of the president's book of secret kind of got blown up with Trump. It's just like, <laughs> you know, the, the office in the 2000s was still regarded as this, you know, the president is this, you know, important, responsible person who's, you know, in charge of these se terrible secrets that are all, you know, too awful for the rest of us to ever know. Um, but, you know, it's, it still worked back in 2007. But luckily, again, because they were making it up as we went along, they decided that the book, which had started off as really big, in an attache case, chained to the wrist of a Secret Service agent, um, with locks on the front, we were, I was designing all these complex locking mechanisms for the side of the book and everything. Um, they decided that the book should be hidden in the Library of Congress. And initially they wanted it in the base of a statue, and then they decided it should be on the underside of this bookshelf. And so the size of the hiding place dictated the size of the book, which was fantastic because, and then again, we were in such a rush at this point because they dithered for so long that they were just kind of, yeah, yeah, just figure it out, do, you know, do whatever you want. And I had been working on the thing, um, you know, getting a lot of the uh, secret uh, documents that, that are kind of inserts in the book, but I hadn't uh, really settled on the page layout design of the book yet. So suddenly it was like, okay, now it's small, hurry up and make it. And one of the problems I always had with the, all the extra documents, which they wanted hundreds falling out of the book as they went through it, uh, is you put a hundred sheets of paper in a book and try to close it, you know, good luck, it's gonna be like this, you know. So I designed a kind of a portfolio type of thing that wrapped the book and that way it was more flexible and you could put a hundred documents in there Look odd. Um, so that was made kind of quickly um, for these scenes. So there they are in the Library of Congress first going through the book. The other thing, which is uh, this shot illustrates, is again, there's this whole thing about how a prop works in the scene. 
and then there's always a conversation how it works. So when you have a prop with locks on it, it's like, okay, it's not just how it's gonna look. You have to start thinking about how's the actor gonna work this? And that was also the issue with the uh, chain to the wrist of the Secret Service agent too. It's like, how is he gonna get this book? Like, is he gonna shoot the guy and chop his hand off or what, sweet talk him? Like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, how does this work? So having it in a locked secret uh, spot means the actors don't have to fumble with locks every time they're trying to open the book, which is, you know, that's a thing. It's like, okay, I'm supposed to be opening this book and reading it, but I gotta unlock this lock first. If the book's huge, I have to set it down and fiddle with the lock and open it up. So there's always kind of a conversation about how the prop works, um, and it's an, it's an important part, you know, of it. it can't, you just can't say book, you know, do a book. Um, and it, this illustrates another aspect of this design, which is they could do a low shot of him holding it in one hand and flipping the pages. If he'd had a huge, heavy book, it would have always had to been on a table. It would have always had to been an overhead shot. So this gave the director much more flexibility. So, and again, this is uh, another illustration of how a prop works as exposition. Um, I did a total of I think six or seven books for this film, and they all work in the same way. There, this is a, a movie with a very complicated plot about chasing down the city of gold, and the actors every once in a while have to stop and sort of, for the benefit of us, the viewer, explain what the hell they're doing, which is like, oh, now we're going out to Mount Rushmore, to, that's where the city of gold is, and that's because of, here's this page from this book, and then he went over here. So they are used as plot exposition. The, the pages in the book can be really important plot points. How much screen time did the book have? It gets a lot of screen time. It gets, you know, minutes of screen time, which is really unusual. Um, <coughs> and uh, uh, despite all the research and effort that went into all the documents, you barely see any of them. You do see a couple of shots of the JFK motorcade. Um, we couldn't use the fake moon landing stuff. I created all these photos of a fake moon landing, like on a sound stage. Yeah, somebody wanted to know whether you created the aliens. Yes, yeah, created the alien, that was a Photoshop, you know, uh, Frankenstein together, a bunch of stuff. But this was one of my early experiences working with some, uh, something that they call clearance, which is legal clearance of things that are gonna be in the movie. So you can't just show copyrighted stuff, you can't show people's work and stuff without, um, you know, getting getting a, uh, a signed permission form from them. And so with the fake moon landing stuff, which we spent a ton of time on, the director was really into, uh, Disney said, oh no, Buzz Aldrin's famously litigious because of the flat earth, or the, uh, you know, the fake moon landing people. Um, there's a, actually this, another great thing to look up on YouTube is Buzz Aldrin punching this guy <laughs> who's like three feet taller than him. Bam! He, he's asking him to swear on a Bible that he landed on the moon and Buzz Aldrin just decks on the cross. <laughs> yeah, land on this. Um, so there's the Book of Secrets. Now that boot, that lace that you see on the front cover, that, that came off of a hundred year old boot I found out when we were, when we were traveling out Montana. There was this old boot in a barn. I'm like, something. <laughs> Who steals an old boot lace? Um, and then the buttons on the front are uniform buttons uh, of, apparently they are 19th century, but uh, did some research on them and apparently they were used much earlier or so. Anyway, they had the presidential seal on them, which actually they had the great seal, there's a difference. The presidential seal is from 1850, I think. So when this book was supposed to originate with, uh, with George Washington. Um, so, you know, that's it, stuffed with its 100 documents. There's some of them. The alien autopsy photo is on the upper right there. And then there's a lot of stuff, again, like the fake moon landing piece, so you can't really see it that well, but we took uh, photos of the real moon landing. So, okay, here's where the whole fake moon landing thing comes from. <laughs> if you go to the NASA website, they, it, it, which is, used to be almost impossible to dig through, they have hundreds of photos of them rehearsing the moon landing. Because you figure you're gonna be in an airless environment 
you know, thousands of miles from Earth, maybe you want to practice a little bit just to make sure, you know, you can get back home again. So they tried out all the equipment and they would dress up in the full gear and they had a, you know, a lander there and they would climb down and try the thing for grabbing the moon rocks and go, oh, you know, it doesn't work. I can't get it with these big gloves on. And so you go to the NASA site and there are photos there of this rehearsal. And some of the photos, you could go, oh, hey, they faked the whole thing. They're on some, in some warehouse somewhere, you know. But most of the photos, if you actually go through and look, there's guys in short sleeve white shirts with ties smoking cigarettes <laughs> standing around. <laughs> all these guys in the spacesuits are, are you know, trying out all this stuff. So it's clearly a rehearsal, but that's where the whole fake moon landing thing comes from, is those photos. Um, so I can, believe it. Yeah, <laughs> right? It makes total sense. So um, I took the actual photos from the real moon landing and dropped them into the photos of the rehearsal uh, because they didn't, um, stuff didn't quite match up. The suits weren't the ones that they ended up wearing and the lander looked different. And it was clearly just a, you know, for practice purposes. Um, and then I put an exit sign, you know, over a door in the back, <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, and then I just threw in a lot of stuff, like the, I got a photo of Lizzie Gordon and I wrote Love Lizzie on it, threw it in. And it's just like, so did the director or producer or anybody with authority look at this and yeah, vet it? We had a couple of show and tells um, early on and they just said, come up with stuff, come up with secrets. Um, we didn't know, again, because it's being written on the fly as they're shooting, uh, I, I went and I researched and found documents um, in the handwriting of every president up to Bill Clinton. And I, the only one who's not in there is Nixon. He probably has one word secrets. But, uh, I was, yeah, so it's got handwriting from every president in there and all this other stuff. His prop master was just saying, just do stuff. Like, yeah, you know, I don't know, I don't care. Just, you know, make it up. And then the director saw it, and they we actually they did some shooting with it. And then the director, looking at the stuff, thought, "Oh, this is great. Let's do more of this. Let's do more stuff about the moon landing. Let's do more <laughs> stuff about JFK." So it went from being, you know, oh yeah, yeah, just do some stuff in the background, to being written more in. So what um, happened to this book once it was um, done? So once it was done. I uh, I was actually still working on it, and I was working on uh, the Booth Diary. So there's a John Wilkes Booth Diary that's an appearance in the movie as well, and that's it there. Uh, that's my um, version of it. Um, and I just finished that, and I got a call uh, from them. They had previously been doing a lot of shooting out in LA, so I get a call from the prop master saying, we are shooting down in Washington, and we need you down here on set tomorrow. Um, and I was like, oh, okay. Um, so I caught a train down and brought both of them. And uh, the, they whisked off the Booth Diary to shoot right there. They were shooting scenes, uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but there are scenes that uh, are, take place in the present day, maybe the setting, um, where there's, he's giving, a, Nicholas Cage is giving a lecture showing shots of the booth diary, and then somebody yells him that I'm from the gallery, he's got one of the missing pages. The booth diary is famously missing, everyone says 18 pages, it's actually 27 pages. Um, that's how you know it's a conspiracy theory website. When the guy says, I know it's on the missing 18 pages, you go, ah, there's 27 missing pages, you read it. <laughs> and, um, so they, they wish that off to shoot those scenes, and uh, Prop Master said, oh, while well, you're here, there's been some changes, we need some stuff, and the new document's in the Book of Secrets. And by the time I got there, it was like, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'll work on them right here and now. You know, I thought I was gonna get a cab back to the train station and sleep on the bench until I could get a uh, train back to Connecticut. He's like, no, 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 make some changes, and, you know, do this. So I'm like, okay. And he comes in at about four in the morning, he's like, you're on the crew. <coughs> You're on the crew, I need you here for a week or so. Uh, and I'm like, oh, okay. And uh, I'm like, where am I staying? He said, I'll call the office. 
and you would stay in Crew Hotel. Crew Hotel was full, so I was staying in the Actors Hotel. So then I was on set while they were shooting all the stuff at the Library of Congress. Um, and uh, yeah, so again, this was a research heavy project that had, um, and, and so the Booth Diary in the original script or the, the version of the script that they were shooting when they asked me to make it, just makes a very brief appearance. They said they were clearly aware that the Booth Diary had these missing pages and that it's been the subject of conspiracy theories forever. Um, you know, since they caught Booth, they've been wondering what's on these pages. But they they had uh, just written it in that this guy appears, um, you know, and he's got this missing page and it has a clue on it to how to find the city of gold. So I started doing research because they had said, just get some old diaries, make some old looking diary and we'll just use that. Um, and I started doing research on it, found out all this incredible stuff about, you know, Booth and the diary and everything. So I put together show and tell for the director, and it ended up getting written more into the script. I don't know if it's because of that or they, because he was clearly aware of some of this stuff about it already, but they were, they um, signed off on the whole thing of making an exact replica, which actually turned out to be a problem because the only information I had about the Booth Diary was uh, an FBI file. The FBI uh, kept the uh, FBI kept the file on the Booth um, because there were so many conspiracy theories people writing to the FBI saying, my uncle was in a bar in New Hampshire and he swears he saw, you know, Booth in, on the stool next to him in 1954. With Elvis. Yeah. And that's what this file was full of. This file was huge. It was like, there were six huge PDFs uh, off the FBI website. Um, and there were photographs of the um, Booth diary, but they were bad black and white Xeroxes that had been done in the 70s, almost impossible to decipher. And uh, I could see there was a redacted little card at the bottom. So I um, did some more research and I found out the U.S. Secret Service was formed as an anti counterfeiting uh, arm in the government. And they still are. They handle anything to do with counterfeiting paper and all that stuff. So I figured that must have been them who took these photographs. So I contacted the Secret Service who never called me back, still waiting for that call. And, um, you know, tried all these places, couldn't find them, couldn't find them. So I'd been talking to the woman who was curator at the Ford's Theater Museum. And I mentioned this, I said, I'm trying to get these photos of the booth there. And she said, oh, I've got them right here, I'll send them over. So she sent me the photos. There's one of the Secret Service photos. Um, you can't see it because it's covered up with the diary, but the little card said, says USSS. And so the version of the diary that you see above it there is there are two versions of the diary in the movie because we see uh, Booth with the diary or actually one of his sidekicks. So there's one that looks new, and that's what we're seeing in that photo there. The previous photo was of the uh, beat up old one that we see in the present day. Um, but you can see they went through this diary, the Secret Service tore out the lining and tried to find any hidden secrets in it. Um, so I used these photos and that there, at some point there was a concern from the director that the pages were too narrow because they wanted to put in the missing 27 pages with all kinds of things on them. They wanted to have writing and there was a cipher and stuff. And so I increased the width, I think, by about a quarter of an inch, maybe a little bit less. That's the only change from the original. And the leather, um, a wallet slash cover of the Booth Diary uh, is made from 32 separate pieces. Um, all the leather that you see with the grooving in it, that was all hand done. Um, you know, the, the red is hand dyed. Uh, I recreated the uh, artwork for the postage and tickets and uh, gold stamp. It's gold stamp and 22 karat gold. And how long did this take you? I mean, the research part probably took three weeks, and then the making of it probably took another week and a half, two weeks, you know. It was crazy. Did you get reasonable compensation? I did. I kept sending him invoices, and I kept paying him. 
So at one point, the prime minister said, hey, I just looked at how much we've paid you. And then it's, I'm like, yeah, sorry. You know, they keep, you keep asking for more stuff. So there's kind of what goes into the building of these things. You kind of figure out, how does this work? How much do I need for a fold and a leather? And how much do I need extra to wrap around? And a lot of little diagrams like this, just kind of calculating everything. I go through this with every prop. There I am hand burning the uh, lines into the leather. It's all goat skin, uh, which the original was made of. Um, which they used to call Morocco, Moroccan leather. You know, it's, it's kind of like how Patagonia two fish got called, whatever the hell we call that now. It's like Moroccan leather. No, it's goat skin. Uh, and this is called skiving, where you tear down the edge of the leather. The leather is made really thin, so there's no obvious seam when you glue it down. Uh, I made a total of six copies for the production, and I made uh, a couple of extra copies for myself. I always make nine copies. Um, and that kind of shows the production process just of that prop. I, don't, I didn't take any photos, unfortunately, of making the Book of Secrets, uh, but I did a lot of photos of the process. Is the Book of Secrets the one you threw into the bathtub? No. I, I did this huge book for The Legend of Zorro. The thing was about six inches thick. I think it was like 12 by 18 or 14 by 18, something like that. Gigantic. And it had to be this ancient book. It was described as this ancient book, 5,000 years old, that was printed on papyrus, and it was about the Crusades. So this is another part of the job, is you get the script, you read this, then you have to go back to the prop master and the director and say, okay, the Crusades didn't happen 5,000 years ago, for starters. Nobody printed on papyrus. You can't print on it. It's hard as a rock. And, um, you know, this book would have looked like this. So there's this consultation phase in the beginning. So I said, how about we make it a late 15th century book? Gutenberg started printing books in Europe in 18, around 1415. By, uh, uh, by the end of the 15th century, seven cities in Europe had multiple printers on them, you know, and hundreds and hundreds of books, many of them illustrated woodcuts, had been produced. So the, the technology just spread incredibly rapidly and was improved upon incredibly rapidly. And I, I said, we have this rich source of stuff. They were doing books on the occult and magic and Rosicrucianism, and it's all happening right around the time, at the, you know, the end of the Crusades period. So let's copy it from this. And they said, okay, great. So I did this gigantic book. I think the thing weighed 35 pounds. And uh, okay, I'm like, okay, I gotta age. Well, aging paper uh, involves getting it damp, getting it damp and kind of folding it, beating it up a little, staining the edges and stuff like that. So I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll speed this whole thing up. It's really tedious doing it page by page. I was still kind of learning the process of it. Um, so I took out, we have a fish pond in the backyard. And just thought, yeah, I'll just throw it in the fish pond. I kind of pushed it down with my foot until the bubbles stopped coming out. And then, <laughs> I pulled it out. It now weighed like 600 pounds. And it swelled up to like this thick. And I'm like, oh. Oh, that's why this is not a good idea. Now every page is stuck together and they all have to be dried out. So it took like a week to dry the thing out. And that this happens sometimes way too frequently. But that was the one prop where the FedEx guy is actually standing at my table, like checking his watch while I'm desperately trying to dry the pages out so I can ship it to the set. Um, so yeah, no, that, I learned my lesson by the time I did the Book of Secrets. Now the Book of Secrets, uh, what happened to it once the film was over? It was, uh, the film was hugely popular, so the, and because it was shot in the Library of Congress, the Library of Congress displayed the Book of Secrets for a year, and now it's in the Disney Museum. Oh, wow. So because of the rush, so I, I, again, I brought the Book of Secrets to Washington, and we were, you know, doing some stuff with it there, and then they were changing stuff. So I brought it back with me to Connecticut. I did more work on it. At some point, the, uh, 
the boot lace I used had come loose, one of the buttons had come loose, so I had to reattach them and reinforce them. And then they decided, again, because they were writing on the fly, they decided that they wanted to put some hero pages in where we see some clues to the city of gold. Um, so during that period, and I had already started this before I went down to Washington, I had started making extra copies. And during that period where I was working on new stuff, I, I finished off these extra copies that are, I always do extra copies of a big hero prop like that as a kind of a safety. If something happens to it, you've got one ready to go. Production doesn't have to shut down. But it takes the same amount of time as yeah. to the original. And I don't charge them for that time unless they use it. Then I'll say, okay, I made an extra copy. It took me X hours to do it, and I used X you know, amount of paper, and so it's going to cost. And they're using half to pay it because otherwise they, they can't shoot those scenes. Um, so my copy, I still have my copies of that and the other stuff that I made for the movie. Um, and I made a couple of additional, I think maybe one other production made copy. And I also had tons of stuff like leather, extra bits and pieces half finished. Um, so I sold, there was, a guy contacted me about a year after the movie came out. And so this is my introduction to how popular props are with movie fans. I didn't really understand that at all. My assistant at the time, you can see in that photo, Brian, that's my daughter actually working on the booth <laughs> diary there. Child labor laws, what child labor? <laughs> Never heard of that. Um, so uh, yeah, so I got contacted by year after by this guy who's a collector. And so my, my assistant Brian introduced me to this, like, oh, this is, you know, this is forum, the Prop Replicators Forum. And these guys are really into it. They make all these props and make their own versions. I'm like, what? You know, crazy. I've never even heard of such a thing. And, you know, my previous sort of thoughts, if I ever thought about prop collectors, was that they were probably, you know, Star Wars fans, Star Trek fans. They've never known the touch of a woman. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, you know, that's kind of what you expect, but it's not like that at all. So this guy contacts me, he was assistant director on all the Harry Potter movies and on some of the Star Wars things, and he's a huge prop fan, prop collector. And I was like, oh wow, these guys really do exist, like my assistant told me. And um, he bought a booth diary and a book of secrets, uh, production made, and he just sold them at auction about uh, four or five months ago, and the Book of Secrets went for $35,000 at auction in England, and the Blue Diary went for six grand, um, which was not what I charged by a long shot. Um, so yeah, the, the Blue Diary is still, in, in as far as I know, in the Disney Museum. So that's kind of the chaos that was happening. These, uh, the, my two assistants were full-time students, and the professor gave them permission to not come into class, but instead come work and Brian, who you see there, uh, now works in Hollywood. He designs a lot of posters for like Star Wars and stuff like that. And Carrie, who's back, who's to us on the left there, uh, works a design as a designer at uh, some gigantic design firm now. So they basically got their design education by uh, you know working with slaves. <laughs> uh, so there's the older version of the booth. I think that's actually in the progress of being aged. Um, and that's me aging it, you know, the prop maker's friend, shoe polish. Um, and then Boardwalk Empire uh, was another one where research was a very important part of it um, because this is that, you know, again, National Treasure, they were just kind of learning about, you know, how popular props are and, and let's get them all right. And by Boardwalk Empire, they wanted everything to be exactly like what it was. 1922, to the point where I was actually sending them the, the uh, patents for things like staplers. Oh, really? Yeah. So I'll just whip through these real quick so we can get to some questions. Uh, something that's really hard to find, a license, an Illinois license, like where no one's ever digitized the 1922 Illinois license. Plate. So that I actually tracked down uh, in a uh, small museum that was in a police station. Michael, um, oh God, White. White. what's that? White. White, yes. Michael from White. Uh, he played the character Chocolate White. Um, stationary book, th 
this thing you see from about 40 feet away. And then, even though it was like two weeks work, these are all handset, hand printed from 19th century and early 20th century lead type. Everybody's locked up on the bed of the press. And that's it. <laughs>